Have you ever gotten to a point where you think you're ahead only to find out that you are so far behind? I, I actually I thought this week because we, you know, we had these snow days that I was going to be ahead. And then I looked up and saw this big hairy ugly guy walking through a door and realized that was me. I couldn't catch up. And poor John, he, he didn't get the scriptures or the sermon title or anything like that because I thought I sent it, but I didn't. But I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one who makes mistakes, right? Whew. I thought it was going to be silent there for a minute. <laughs> We've been talking over the last few weeks about preparing ourselves for the coming of Jesus through this Lenten season. And one of the, the most appropriate things that I can give to you as far as maybe insight into what Lent is really about is by telling you about the gifts that God has given us through his Holy Spirit. Paul writes to us in, to the Philippians in chapter 4, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you've done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you, he you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supp supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, I've got a lot more to share today as far as Scripture goes, but I, I want to focus on this for a minute. Paul, it, he, he is not necessarily talking about the gifts of the Spirit in this case when he is giving thanks for their gifts. In fact, what he's saying to them is, Thank you for helping me along the way when I didn't have means to help myself. Thank you for sending gifts to me when no one else did. Thank you for helping to support me when I felt like I was at my wit's end. Now, it could be that all they did for him was send him money, though I, I seriously doubt it. I think really probably more what he's saying is I thank you for the support, the prayer support, the financial support. And just being there, letting other people know about the things that I've told you. He says, people all over Asia, all over Asia Minor, all over know about the good news, not because of me, but because of you. You listened to what I had to say, and you carried the message on. That is a glorious gift. And I'm not, he says, I'm not telling you this because I want your money or that I need your money. I'm telling you this so you'll be buoyed up in the Spirit, so that you'll know that I love you, but I, my love is nothing compared to what God has for you. So he says, I know what it's like to be hungry. And I think I would not be mistaken if I said, not just physically hungry, but spiritually hungry. He says, I know what it's like to be hungry, to have an empty stomach, and to have an empty spirit. But I also know what it's like to be full, to have my physical body full, but also to be full of the Holy Spirit. We, we concern ourselves, and I say we, I mean me, we concern ourselves so much with this material existence that we forget that that's not really what we're supposed to be worrying about at all. We're supposed to be carrying on the message, the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone in the world. How do we know that? Because that's what Jesus told us to do. 
He didn't beat around the bush. He said, as soon as you leave your door, the first person you come to, you start talking to them about what I told you. And then you talk to the next person and the next person until you reach the ends of the earth. In Paul's time, saying the ends of the earth was not a, a, a figurative form of speech. He was literally saying, if there are people there, you better go there and tell them about me. What a task. They didn't have the internet. Didn't have ways that they could just talk to one another across the miles. Heck, they didn't have phones. They didn't have, well, they, if they wanted to write, they had to find really, really expensive paper papyrus, or they had to carve it out in some clay. It, it wasn't really a, 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 an easy thing to do. So when Jesus said, go into all the world and do this, they were daunted by that task, as I'm sure you feel the same way. We're, uh, go into all the world. I, I have a hard time talking to the people at work. Right? Or is it just me? I, 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 I want to, Lord. I, I want to do that, but, but, but I don't know how. If you've ever said to yourself, but I don't know how, 1 Thessalonians, remember he was just talking about the Thessalonians in Thessalonica. <laughs> we know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. Let me read that last one again. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. Hmm. Hmm. In this way, you imitate both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all believers in Greece throughout Macedonia and Achaia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever you go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He's the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. So I would like to be able to feel comfortable talking to people, but... What I want and what I'm able to do sometimes don't jive, right? I want to go to work and I want to, in, I want to invite them to Jesus, not invite them to church, although that may be their, their way to Jesus, but I want to invite them to Jesus and I want to give them what I feel like Jesus would have done had he been in my place. We don't sometimes feel comfortable. In fact, there are, a lot, there are a lot of times we feel very uncomfortable. But Paul says, the only way you're ever going to feel comfortable by doing this is to accept that the Holy Spirit does the work for you. You don't have to do anything. Just be receptive to the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, I hear a lot of talk about that Holy Spirit thing. And Pastor, you've talked about the Holy Spirit a lot since you've been here. But exactly what is it? Anybody ever wonder what is the Holy Spirit? I'm the only idiot here. Okay. <clears throat> in a lot of denominations, in a lot of um, versions of our faith, there are people who put a lot of emphasis on one spiritual gift over all the others. They might put a, an extremely heavy importance on the gift of prophecy. That, that as a group, as a church, they are able to know what God knows. No, that's not the way it works. And in some churches, they put a lot of emphasis on speaking in other languages to the detriment of 
those who, who don't have that gift. Because if you don't have that gift and you feel pressured to do it, what are you going to do? You're going to fake it. You're going to fake it. The Holy Spirit is not here to emphasize one gift over another. In fact, if you recall, he said we are all a part of the same body. Every one of us has a job to do. Now, are you going to be mad when you find out you're a foot and you really want to be a mouth? Because I got foot in mouth all the time. Paul makes that analogy simply to say this. Look, maybe you don't have the most glorious job in God's kingdom, but you know what? All jobs are glorious in God's kingdom. All jobs are equal in the sight of God. So you go to work and you, you have this feeling of, of, of joy and power that the Holy Spirit has infused in you and, and you boldly go up to someone and they shut you right down. That ever happened to anybody before? Yeah. They just shut you down. I don't, man, I don't want to hear this. I, I, I'm glad that you found whatever it is you found and I'm, it looks like it's making you happy, but that's not what I'm about. Thanks, but don't, I don't want to talk about it. Right? Paul says to us that the only way that Jesus' message will be spread throughout the world is by the Holy Spirit. Now, they lived in a time, as I said before, when uh, messages took a very, very long time to get from one place to the other. But Paul was amazed because when he went to Thessalonica, he had already heard about their good works everywhere. Everywhere he went, he heard about what, what great things they were doing. But I want to refer back to Philippians. Whereas Paul doesn't say, hey, good job, I hear about you everywhere I go. He says to them, I want to thank you. Because when I was in need, you knew that need by the Holy Spirit. I wasn't with you, but yet you knew. Even when I was in Thessalonica, when I was talking to the church that t tells everybody about you, even when I was there, you sent me gifts. You made it so that I could eat. Now, you may or may not know this from catechism or Bible, whatever. Paul was a tent maker. He, he actually had a job. He was a Pharisee, don't get me wrong. He, he was of the highest educational level. But when he, went, when he went out on his missions to teach about Jesus, he worked with his hands everywhere he went. Now, why do you think he did that? Well, let me, let me ask you this. What would you have done if you were a tent maker and some fellow walked up into your midst and said, hey, I've got something way more important than feeding your children. Are you awake? W what if he would have said, hey, uh, good job building, making those tents, but, but stop because I've got something more important. He did have something more important to tell them, but he also recognized the fact that feeding the children or feeding themselves first the physical, then the spiritual. He said, I, everywhere I've gone, I've worked humbly. And you've seen me do that, and, and you've, you've wanted to know what made me a former Pharisee, the, the most literate person, who's visited you in a long time, why would I sit down with you and make tents? And he said, I do this because if you see that I'm just like you, you'll see that God's love is for everyone. Especially in Greece, especially to the, the pagans who believed in a pantheon, believed in gods for everything. For Paul to say, God, the God, the only God, loves you in the same way he loves me, in the same way that he loves everyone on this planet, so much so that he sent his only son to die for you. They were a lot more receptive hearing it when he was sitting with them sewing tents than they would have been if he had walked in with fancy clothes and garb and walked up and said, I have something really important for you. I, I, I know that I'm not talking to anybody in here, but I, I, do, I, 
I say this so that in case you recognize somebody in this, you'll know what I'm talking about. There are times, especially when we are on what we call a spiritual high or on a mountaintop, where we feel like every word that comes out of our mouth is uh, some kind of beautiful message from God and that everyone is going to be receptive to it. They're going to hear it and they're going to be changed. No, no. I wish that that were true. You know, the truth of the matter is, most often people come to the Lord when they are at their most desperate. When they've reached the point where they can't go down any further, that's when they look up and see Jesus. So when we come to people on a spiritual high and they're at the very lowest spot they can be, they're not going to be super receptive to what we have to say. When I say, put yourself in that man's shoes or that woman's shoes, what I'm saying is, think about what situation they might be going through. Now, I don't know how it is at your day job, but at my day job, I hear a lot of gossip and a lot of garbage. And I, I have, since I've been teaching, I've never eaten lunch in the, in the break room or, or teacher's lounge. I, I just don't do it. And even when I wasn't particularly in tune with God, I still didn't do it because I just, I felt weird sitting there listening to people talk about people I didn't really know and then laughing about it. Never been in that situation, have you? It just makes me uncomfortable. Well, you know what? Sometimes when we're talking about Jesus to people who aren't receptive, we're making them extremely uncomfortable. We're not putting them on a level plane with us. We're not thinking about what it would be like to walk in their shoes. What we're thinking about is, God has blessed me so much, I can't wait to bless others. And I don't know about you, but when somebody seems to me like they're maybe a little bit superior or they think they're a little bit superior to me, I have a tendency to go, okay, thank you. We'll talk about this later. And then I avoid them like the plague. Right? We are not morally above anyone. We are not spiritually above anyone. God loves every single human being who has ever drawn breath. Do you understand that? Every human being. He has said that humanity is his perfect prize, his most prized possession. It's not our job to go out and save people. It's not our job to go out and tell people, if you don't come to church... Because you, know, you know what they're going to say? I've been getting along just fine without it. Why would I go now? Think about it. Paul talked about the Holy Spirit in ways that seem incomprehensible to us. He talked about the Holy Spirit because he knew firsthand the Holy Spirit. When Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, he met the Holy Spirit face to face. Now, there are a lot of denominations and a lot of variations of our faith that say that there, there, there aren't three, there's no trinity, there's one God. And I'm not gonna go into a, philosophical debate about that right now, but I will say this. The Holy Spirit is God, but he is also in us. He is the form of God that he gave to us as a beautiful gift to help us to know how to proceed in our belief. When Paul talks about newborn Christians, he likens, he, he, he makes this analogy that when you, when you have a newborn baby, you don't cut up a steak and feed the baby the steak. You, just, you don't do it. It doesn't have any teeth. It's going to choke on it. When you are with a brand new Christian, 
Don't start talking about all these esoteric things. Don't start talking about, oh, you wouldn't believe what God did for me this week. He was just so... Because they're going to go, I did not sign up for that. (laughs) Just the same way that if a baby can't process a steak, young Christians, newly formed Christians, they can't understand the depth of the Holy Spirit. Now, maybe you're sitting there and you're going, well, I don't understand it either, and I've been going to church forever. Let me see if I can explain it to you in a really, really short, brief way. Jesus came to earth, God in the form of man. He went to the cross for our sins. He stayed around and taught his disciples and brought many, many people into the church. In fact, he started the church. And then he ascended into heaven. But before he did that, even before he went to the cross, he said, I'm going to send somebody here to help you, a helper. He's, we're going to call him the advocate because what he's going to do is he's going to stand in your place. He's going to stand in front of you. So when the enemy attacks, you've got somebody to be in front of you, an advocate to let you know how to fight back. You know, we're not supposed to be timid. When, when the enemy fights with us, it's our duty to fight back. If we know that one of our brothers and sisters is battling something, it is our bounden duty to fight back. We don't know what the situation is because it's not for us to know. But we do know that God has called us to be helpful to one another. Now, I don't know. I don't know really how in, in non theologic terms I can put this, but the Holy Spirit is that still small voice. It's that, that, that pulling at your heart. When you know that there's something not right and you're not sure what it is, but you feel compelled to pray. The Holy Spirit is that part of you that cries out for union with God. He wants to be united with our souls, our spirits, but he also longs with our spirit to be with God. Now, how can that be if he is God? Paul tells us this, that there are times when we want to pray, but we don't know what to pray. We don't even know how to pray. We just know that we're supposed to pray. And sometimes our spirit prays for us. And it lets out these moanings and groanings that we don't understand. It speaks to God for us. Our spirit joins with his spirit and prays for what we don't know. Now, that is not listed under the spiritual gifts. You know why? Because everybody has it. If you are a believer in Christ and you have dedicated your life to Jesus and you have committed yourself to doing the very best you can for the kingdom of God, you have that gift. The book tells us, Paul tells us that we all have different gifts. But the glorious thing is we all have that gift. We all have the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit manifests itself in different ways. Some of us are meant to be apostles, and some are meant to be evangelists, and some are meant to be teachers, and some are meant to be encouragers, and and it goes on and on and on. And just because I've been given a gift of encouraging others doesn't mean that I expect the same thing from you. You ever been in a rotten mood? Anybody? Well, I haven't. I don't know what you're talking about, but. Sometimes we're just in a rotten mood and people try to cheer us up and what happens? It just makes it worse. Just leave me alone. I want to be a grouch. Not everybody feels the same thing you feel. Not everybody expresses love in the same way that you express love. Not everyone has the same gift that you have. Now, Paul is specific. 
And he tells us in 1 Corinthians, he says that no one gift is more important than any other. And I want to go back to what I said earlier. There are some groups who put so much emphasis on one gift or the other that they forget that maybe some people in their congregation don't have that gift. Right? Maybe your gift is to be an encourager. And for whatever reason, you try to help somebody who you know needs help and they just go, I want to be a grouch. Just leave me alone, I want to be a grouch. I mean, I have been there. I, I've been on both sides. I've been the encourager and I've been the, the grouch. And when you're trying to encourage someone who doesn't want to be encouraged, guess what? It's very discouraging. Did you hear that? You are called to do two things. Jesus was specific. He didn't, he didn't put it in fancy, eloquent language. He said this, love God, the Father, with everything you have. If it's in your wallet, love him with that. Because one of the gifts of the Spirit is to be a giver. If, you're, if you love God from your heart and you want other people to be as encouraged as you, then do the very best you can. Encourage them. But know when there's a point, there, there's a point when you have to step back. And that's called the discernment of spirits. Okay. Now, the discernment of spirits almost never gets talked about, no matter what church you go to. And it's just as important as all the others. When you are talking to someone and you know you are 100% positive that your message is bouncing off their forehead back into space, the spirit will lead you to back off. Or at times the spirit may say, they're starting to crack. Keep, keep work. Don't, you know, don't push, don't pressure, but just keep working. See, the Spirit works with us. The Spirit is God within us. We have to not only acknowledge that He exists, the Holy Spirit is, is one part of three, but we also have to recognize that He, the Holy Spirit, is working with us. He doesn't do all the work. We, we would like for him to do all the work because that'd be a whole lot easier for us, but we're called to do the job and we are given an advocate, a helper. If I tried to do plumbing in my house, <laughs> well, I did try one time and, <laughs> and it wasn't pretty. If I tried to do some electrical thing in my house, notice I said thing because I don't know, some thing in my house to do with electricity, I'm going to get shocked. I might burn my house down. I, I don't have those abilities. Some of you have them and you have them so tremendously that you can simply look at a situation and know exactly how to solve it. I don't have that. But praise God if you do. Paul said this. He said, and, I, and I've said this already. He said, I've, I've known what it's like to be starving. I mean, I know what it's like to, to be so hungry that you can't think about anything else. But I've also known what it's like to be so full that I don't even care when my next meal is going to come. He, re he relayed that in a way that we would understand through our bellies, but he was really talking about our spirit. When Paul was dressed in fine robes and when he went to the temple to say his prayers and when he stood on the street corner to say his eloquent prayers and, and in his finery, he was saying, I, I was starving I was spiritually starving. I had no idea what God was 
or what he meant to me. But now that I know Jesus, I have, I have enjoyed the bread of life. I have drank from the fountain of living water. I don't have to worry anymore about where my next meal's coming from because I know if God wants me to eat, he'll send ravens with food. He'll drop manna out of heaven. If he really, really wants me to eat, he will provide. Don't ever get caught up in, and I say, I'm really, I, I really am saying this to myself. Don't ever get caught up in the fact that if only I had, if only I had, I'd be so much happier if, if no, Paul says, rather than worry about what you don't have, be thankful for what you do have. Give God credit and glory and honor and praise for what you have. Because if you have him, you don't need anything else. I, I, that's, I would say that's kind of simple. Simple yet extremely profound. Amen? Amen? If you have God, don't worry about the other things. The Holy Spirit is the way that you can get around fear. The Holy Spirit is... The, the vessel that God has, that God is, that God uses to break you away from the ways of the world, which include fear, anxiety, depression, all of those things that attack all the time. You know, I, I remember I said, I, I, sometimes I'd just rather be grumpy. Sometimes, I, I, I mean it, sometimes I'd rather people just leave me alone. I need to work this out on my own. Is there anybody here like that? I need to work this out on my own. Just thank you for your help, but leave me alone. The good news is, the blessing of God is, that even when we don't acknowledge that the Holy Spirit works for us, He works for us. Even when we don't acknowledge that He's working for us, He is working for us. You see... If you have a good attorney and you go to court, if you have a good attorney, he's not going to run into the, to the courtroom completely unprepared and go, I I'm not really familiar with this case, but, but I think I can take it on. And yet, that's what we do a lot. Somebody comes to us and says, could you pray for my aunt? She's been in the hospital. And you go, absolutely. Let's pray. You know, there's some preparation that goes into that there's some getting in touch with the spirit that has to go with that now i'm not saying god won't hear your prayer because he will he'll he will enthusiastically hear your prayer but if we pray fervently if we pray without stopping if we pray with everything that we have that that's like going into a courtroom as a lawyer being overly prepared you have enough evidence that no matter what anyone says, you can refute it or you can corroborate it. God has a plan, and guess what? You're in it. Whether you acknowledge the fact that you're in it or not really doesn't matter. You can say, oh, well, you know that sinners are part of God's plan? Do, hello? Hello? Did you know that, that everything that has life is part of God's plan? If you didn't know that, you should probably dust your Bible off and read it. Everything that God created is part of his perfect plan. And when people look at you and go, stay away from me with that holy roller crazy Jesus freak stuff, then you just back off. Back off. You're right, I'm sorry, I, I, I was too... I jumped in there to, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I should have respect, respected your, your, your privacy. But in the background, you just keep praying for them. You just keep preparing yourselves. You keep tilling that field because at some point you're going to drop a seed in there and it's going to take root. Keep praying. Keep 
doing all of the things that you know need to be done. Intercessory prayer means that you stand in place of that other person. They, know, they need prayer, but they don't know it. So you pray for them. How do you do that? I don't know. Just do it. Just do it. I don't know what your prayer needs are if you don't tell me, but I know that I, I'm always praying for you. Somebody said, well, how do, you, how do you keep track of who you're praying for? Because I have a, a paper that's just columns after columns of names, and they have scriptures beside each name to remind me that God and his word are for all of us. We don't just exist to breathe air. We exist to glorify God. And so as we prepare for Jesus, for his return, his triumphal return, we have to prepare ourselves like an attorney who prepares himself for his court case. We have to get in and we have to study it. We have to figure out every angle that the enemy is going to come at us. And we've got to be one step ahead and when we know that somebody is hurting inside, we have to step in in their place and be an advocate for them. Let the Holy Spirit tell you what to pray about. Or if he doesn't tell you what to pray about, it doesn't matter, pray anyway. Amen? When the, when the people of Jerusalem welcomed Jesus the week before on Palm Sunday, they cried out, Hosanna. And for the longest time, I thought Hosanna meant like, praise God, hooray. It means help us, save us. They were begging him, save us. But they weren't going about it the right way. They just wanted the Romans out. They didn't care. They just really, they wanted the Romans out. Let us live our own lives. We'll do our own thing. You do your own thing. So when they said help us, they just wanted him to drive out the Romans. But he had a better plan. And it only took three or four days for the enemy to change the heart of every single person who had said Hosanna. Because then they cried out, crucify him. And you know what? He said, okay. If that's what you want. I know that's what I was sent here for, so if that's what you want, that's what I'm going to do. I am going to step in in your place, and I'm going to take the punishment for your sin. And then I'm going to send an advocate who's going to show you all of the ways of God. But you have to be open and receptive. You have to let him show you. You have to read your word. You have to pray. You have to prepare yourself for battle. So here is my charge for you for this week. We're going to prepare ourselves, but not in the way that some of, of the, the other denominations do, by giving something up. We're going, to, we're going to do, we're going to think of it in the positive. To prepare ourselves for Jesus, we're going to think in the positive. Lord, I will do whatever you want me to do. Just, I, whatever you want, you just say the word and I'll do it. Isaiah said, I'm here, Lord, send me. He didn't know what he was saying because he was a little kid. But he found out soon enough. Be prepared. And the only way to be prepared is to prepare. Amen.